Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Thursday edition of the Three Martini Lunch, along with Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. We have good, really good, and crazy martinis for conservatives today. All of it brought to you by another brand new sponsor, Lending Club. We'll have much more to talk about on that later, but LendingClub.com slash martini is where you want to go if you need to consolidate uh, your debt and also find a way to lend money at a good rate. So, uh, Jim, the big news that will encompass our first two martinis today is the retirement of Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy. He has been on the high court since early 1988. That's 30 years. Um, we we're pretty sure this was coming. This doesn't really surprise a lot of people. The liberals are freaking out, as we'll discuss in our second martini today. We're going to talk first, though, about what kind of legacy uh, Justice Kennedy leaves. Uh, here's what Mitch McConnell focused on yesterday, to no surprise, as he had made the announcement on the Senate floor. In particular, we owe him a debt of thanks for his ardent defense of the First Amendment and the First Amendment's right to political speech. McConnell's enthusiasm just overwhelms. But, of course, Citizens United is the one that Mitch McConnell loves the best. And uh, he was uh, always opposed to campaign finance reform in the McCain-Feingold form. Uh, so there are a lot of things that we have applauded Justice Kennedy for uh, over the years. He wrote a blistering dissent of Justice uh, Chief Justice Roberts' ridiculous majority opinion in the Obamacare case six years ago. He was on the right side of virtually every case here in this session that we've celebrated on an almost daily basis here in the month of June. And over the years, he's uh, come through on some very important cases as well from a constitutional perspective. But on the other hand, uh, from the social conservative perspective, uh, a lot of people think uh, the Supreme Court invented the right to an abortion, invented the right to gay marriage. Uh, Justice Kennedy wasn't there in 1973, but he was there in 1992. And according to all reports, flip-flopped on Planned Parenthood v. Casey, which pretty much would have sent the issue back to the states. And obviously, we just saw the Obergefell decision a few years ago. He was also on what we would probably say was the wrong side of the eminent domain kilo case a number of years ago, and some others, including affirmative action over the years. So, uh, Jim, what kind of report card do you give Justice Kennedy? I think I'd probably give him a B, uh, maybe a B plus. There's no point, there's no disputing that he got more right than wrong from the perspective of most conservatives. Uh, I think you could probably characterize him on the, you know, the realm of, of political philosophy, uh, probably closer to a libertarian perspective, um, or at least that's how the, the decisions seem to, to shake out for that. Uh, a decent amount of skepticism of, of government activism and compelled speech and things like that. But also, obviously, a couple of decisions that came down that very much were, were not what social conservatives wanted to hear. I do think it's kind of interesting that to see how quickly he became perceived as the swing vote, and, and, and functionally he was on a bunch of issues that came before the court. But those of us who remember the days of Sandra Day O'Connor will remember when she was. And Kennedy was considered, uh, along with Thomas and uh, sometimes Rehnquist and sometimes uh, and, you know, usually Scalia, he was considered one of the more or less reliable conservatives at one point. So I, I have a theory that when there are nine justices, that, you know, let's say about three on each side are always going to be considered uh, pretty, you know, reliable, you know, predictable. You know, you kind of know what they're going to say before the, even before the case gets before them. And then of those who are, in, you know, those leftovers, there's always going to be a least conservative amongst the conservatives, a least liberal amongst the liberal. I know some people don't like these terms. You might prefer strict constructionist, uh, uh, traditionalist, however you want to characterize them. There's always going to be, in a group of five, there's going to be the one who's the least anchored uh, amongst them, for lack of a better term. And so my suspicion is, is that, you know, we'll see who President Trump nominates. We'll talk about that in a little bit. There's a good chance, having seen Roberts surprise the heck out of us on the Obamacare decision, and, you know, when I say surprise, I probably should say enrage, infuriate, <laughs> bewilder, uh, a lot of terms there. So my suspicion is, is that, you know, you'll, you know, was Kennedy a swing vote? Yes, but he was a swing vote that was probably one notch to the right of Sandra Day O'Connor. Um, and if, you know, my suspicion is that, in, you know, if we, people can come, come back to me in a decade or so, or maybe five years from now and say, okay, I think John Roberts will turn into the new swing vote. And there might be some people going, ah, oh, here we go again. It's David Souter all over again. But I don't think Roberts is going to be all that consistent. I think every once in a while, his philosophy, his worldview, his interpretation of the constitution is going to deviate from the majority of the folks on the right and probably bug us a bunch, but he'll still be one more notch to the right 
than Kennedy was. So the good news is, in our minds, the court is moving in the right direction, both lowercase r and capital R. <laughs> right. um, but it also is, is you know, you're, there's no justice who's going to come along perfectly the way you like. I do think it's safe to say that as his uh, years on the court advanced, he got a little bit less uh, uh, predictable. Uh, we used to joke about it depends on which side of the bed he got out that morning. Uh, I don't think it's outrageous to say that his decision in the gay marriage case was written with history in mind. It was a kind of excessively flowery and, and you know, patting himself on the back. You know, he knew he was writing this one for the history books. And he really, you know, clearly figured someday these words would be inscribed in some monument somewhere to him or something like that. So look, there were times he could drive us bonkers. But I think overall, he, you know, he got more right than he got wrong. And, and no justice is going to be perfect in your eyes. So uh, I'm feeling rather um, you know, sympathetic to him. And here's the thing. If he'd hung on for another year and there was a Democratic Senate, <laughs> you know, maybe I wouldn't have felt the same way. Also, it's going to be really kind of fascinating. Here's the guy who wrote the majority opinion in the, the gay marriage case. And you figured this would earn him adoration from the left forever. But because <laughs> of his timing, uh, uh, instantly people can't stand him. There, there was a comedian who was joking about killing him last day. Which, by the way, if you're really upset about Anthony Kennedy <laughs> leaving the court, killing him really wouldn't fix the problem, pal. That's, that It gets you in the same place. I, you know, Besides the fact that you probably deserve a visit from law enforcement in some format just to check say hey you know we we really shouldn't joke about assassinating supreme court justices yeah um, this isn't the pelican brief pal <laughs> so yeah let's jump right into our second good martini then because the liberal reaction to this has been apoplectic uh, here's once again the very emotional mitch mcconnell uh explaining what his plan for this upcoming nomination is the senate stands ready to fulfill its constitutional role by offering advice and consent on President Trump's nominee to fill this vacancy. We will vote to confirm Justice Kennedy's successor this fall. So then the Senate Democratic leader Chuck Schumer got up and uh, he doesn't want it to happen this year at all. He says because the Republicans led by McConnell would not allow the vote on Merrick Garland two years ago, precedent says that we have to wait for a new Senate to get elected since this is a federal election year. Our Republican colleagues in the Senate should follow the rule they set in 2016, not to consider a Supreme Court justice in an election year. Senator McConnell would tell anyone who listened that the Senate had the right to advise and consent, and that was every bit as important as the president's right to nominate. Now let's get more hysterical. Now here's Chuck Schumer. Sounds like he's uh, advocating who to vote for for Senate, but here's what he wants in a new Supreme Court justice, or doesn't want. Will Republicans and President Trump nominate and vote for someone who will preserve protections for people with pre-existing conditions? Or will they support a justice who will put health insurance companies over patients or put the federal government between a woman and her doctor? I don't know. Hopefully they'll just follow the Constitution. Here's Chris Matthews over on MSNBC saying it's time for vengeance. But to give this to the Republicans when they control the Senate, basically 51 or 50 to 49, really, with John McCain, perhaps not voting again, to give them this last chance to pack the court 5-4 again, hard conservative. I again, I say this, the base will attack the leadership for this if they allow it to happen. And they should, because this is time for vengeance for what happened two years ago. And if they don't wreak the vengeance now with four and a half weeks, four and a half months to go before the election, they will not look very strong to their base. Packing the court, time for vengeance. But that was mild compared to Twitter, Jim. Hats off to the Daily Caller for compiling some of these. We'll just go through a couple. Al Sharpton, we have no choice but to organize, strategize, vote, and act. Ambivalent attitudes are not an option. All civil and human rights are at stake. What side are you on? These are all blue check people, by the way. Molly Knight, how very cool of Justice Kennedy to pour kerosene on the current dumpster fire that is America. The Roe v. Wade riots should provide fine entertainment for him in his retirement. Somebody named Ian Samuel, the crisis, my brothers and sisters, is here. The crisis has come. So, Jim, I don't know how many people's hair is literally on fire, but metaphorically, it was happening all over the place yesterday. Yeah, God, where to begin? I mean, look, if you want to say... The Schumer statement about, well, it's an election year, so we should wait until after the November elections before we even consider this uh, Supreme Court justice. You can make that argument. It's worth noting that in 2016, it was a presidential election. This is a midterm election. But this is the sort of thing you say when you're really much more certain 
Or this would be a better thing to say when you're really more certain you're going to win control of the chamber, Greg. And, you know, yes. polling remains to be seen. But you've got a whole bunch of uh, red state Democrats. And then it's not certain that Democrats will win the majority in the Senate. It's 51-49 right now. But uh, obviously, Joe Manchin is sweating and Heidi Heitkamp is sweating and Joe Donnelly is sweating. And oh, by the way, all three of them voted for Neil Gorsuch back in uh, April 2017. So all kinds of dynamics at play there. My suspicion is, is that you'll see all Republicans unifying on this. I know you're seeing Democrats saying, oh, we just have to flip two. And well, I mean, you know, there are times Susan Collins has frustrated us. There are times at least in Murkowski has frustrated us. But by and large, they also always voted for Supreme Court nominees, provided that they're qualified. Worth noting here, by the way, we all remember that Trump came out with his pre-election list of potential Supreme Court justices. I want to say there was 20 some names on it, and then he expanded it a little bit. This struck me as kind of a stunt when he did it. And in fact, Greg, I don't know about you, I think this is one of the best ideas to come along, down the, the pike in politics in a long time, because it gives voters in a presidential uh, election a, a sense to, uh, the kind of, kind of insurance against a David Souter, right? The idea that, you know, you know what kind of judges you're going to get from a nominee. And, uh, you know, most conservatives, uh, look, Trump is very much plugged in with the Leonard Leos of the world and the Federalist Society and conservative, you know, judicial minds. They kind of helped him assemble that 20 guy and gal all-star team of nominees. At first glance, all of them looked super duper spectacular. I'm sure they're going to do a thorough background check to make sure none of them have any skeletons in their closet or potential controversies or something like that. But, you know, they're all experienced. They're all bright. They're all very clear in their judicial philosophy. They're exactly what conservatives want to see. And so, man, oh, man, you want to talk about this sort of thing that makes conservatives say, gee, maybe we, are, we really are getting tired of winning. Then it becomes a decision where I, my suspicion is, is that the, all 51 Republicans would vote in favor of the nominee. Yes, there's a question of John McCain. He has not voted since December. He's still undergoing cancer treatment. There's a bit of a, you know, a question of will he be able to be in Washington I could be totally wrong, Greg, but I have a suspicion that if McCain's absence is the sort of thing, is a difference between confirmation and rejection of a good Supreme Court nominee, my sneaking suspicion is at that point McCain might retire. I, I think he, as much as he does not want to retire, as much as he enjoys his job and serving the people of Arizona, at that point, the illness would start to become an issue. Just, just my gut feeling. I could be totally wrong here. Maybe the best case scenario for the Democrats, if they want to block this, is to have the Heidi Heitkamps and Joe Manchins and Joe Donnelly's and all the other red state Democrats looking so bad for November that they might as well vote no because it's not going to hurt them any worse. Probably the best case scenario for Republicans is to have all those red state Democrats trailing, but not by a ton. <laughs> to know if they decide to vote no on a good qualified nominee that's very popular in their red states, that that would be that would sink their uh, their reelection chances. So we'll we'll see how it all shakes out. But my question is, those red state Democrats are dreading the vote. They're probably gonna, probably at least a handful are going to vote yes, and you end up with something in the neighborhood of you know fifty four, fifty five, fifty six senators voting to com to confirm. Uh, and you know, look, I think this takes care of any uh, turnout issues that the Republicans have had. I mean, this is exactly the sort of thing that fires up the conservative base. Even Trump's fiercest critics in the party will we generally say that his judicial picks have been pretty darn good. So you want to unite Republicans and, and get them as fired up as Democrats have been throughout the era of Trump. I think this is exactly the sort of thing that you want to see. And we're going to have a fun, exciting, you know, probably even more heated political environment in summer and fall than we have already, Greg. So everybody buckle your seatbelts. Absolutely. It's kind of ironic that such a huge uh, chaotic fight, which is almost sure to happen here, is for the same seat where this whole nonsense started. 31 years ago when Reagan nominated Robert Bork and Ted Kennedy and crew sunk that one. Uh, then there was Judge Ginsburg, who once smoked pot. Can you imagine that sinking a nominee now if they smoked pot 20 years ago? And then finally, Kennedy was the third choice there. So this seat, once again, will be the, the focus of great political conflict. But while the Democrats are wringing their hands and setting their hair on fire, what about the problems that you might have, including a lot of debt? Because for decades, Credit cards have been telling us, buy it now and pay for it later with interest. And despite your best intentions, that interest can get out of control fast. With Lending Club, you can consolidate your debt or pay off credit cards with one fixed monthly payment. Since 2007, Lending Club has helped millions of people regain control of their finances with affordable fixed rate personal loans. No trips to a bank, no high interest credit cards. 
Just go to LendingClub.com and tell them about yourself and how much you want to borrow. Pick the terms that are right for you. And if you're approved, your loan is automatically deposited into your bank account in as little as a few days. Lending Club is the number one peer-to-peer lending platform with more than $35 billion in loans issued. Go to LendingClub.com slash martini. Check your rate in just minutes and borrow up to $40,000. That's LendingClub.com slash martini. LendingClub.com slash martini. All loans made by WebBank, member FDIC, equal housing lender. All right, Jim, as we get ready for a fun Supreme Court justice nomination battle over the summer, uh, a lot of assumptions are being made about how Democrats feel about conservatives and conservatives feel about Democrats and liberals and some socialists now, as we described yesterday. So a couple of scholars commissioned a poll by YouGov, which takes a look at what the opposite parties think of each other and what the reality is. For example, uh, they asked Republicans about Democrats. They asked Democrats about Republicans. So how many Democrats, they asked of Republicans, are agnostics or atheists? The actual share, 9 percent. Estimated by Republicans, 36 percent. Black, the Republicans thought about 46 percent. It's actually 24 percent. LGBT, the Republicans thought it made up 38 percent of the Democratic Party. It's actually six. And union members, they thought it was 44 percent. It's actually 11. They asked Democrats, how many Republicans are 65 or older? They thought it was 44 percent. It's actually 21. Evangelicals, 44 percent. It's actually 34. Southerners, 44. It's actually 36. And my personal favorite, earning more than $250,000 a year, 44 percent of Democrats thought 44 percent of Republicans made over a quarter million dollars a year. The actual number is two. So, Jim, um, the stereotyping is strong with these ones. By the way, when uh, when Greg says two, he doesn't mean two percent. He means just two actual Republicans. <laughs> no, it was two percent. But no, it, kind of fascinating that the only you know qu- the only remote defense I could make of the Republican answers is if some if you dramatically overestimate what percentage of Democrats are gay and the number the per- actual percentage turns out to be way lower than the number you gave, you might be able to say, well, I meant closeted too. <laughs> uh, but in all likelihood, you know, it, it kind of indicates that both parties see a bunch of stereotypes on the other side they see they they you know see certain traits that really aren't representative of them uh, i guess we should give the democrats for being not terribly far away in their estimates of what percentage were evangelical and what percentage were southern but you know if you want to get this feeling of the idea that we're, we're separating not culturally into two you know i would say two americas but then it would sound like john edwards red states and blue states right the idea of, of two two groups that really don't interact with each other very much and as a result of that, don't have a really accurate picture of who makes up the other side. That's a, a kind of frustrating uh, state to be in. Uh, I do recall a separate study a couple of years ago, which basically said to members who, who identify with a particular party, can you articulate the argument put forth by the other side? Like if you're a, um, a Republican who wants less spending, why do you think Democrats want to have more spending? And the, generally they found that Republicans could articulate and, and kind of lay out the arguments that they understood the Democratic arguments. They disagreed with them, but at least they understood it. You know, they did, well, we want to help people. And we think these programs, even if they're inefficient, they do more good and they justify the cost, blah, blah, blah. The Democrats in this survey or in this study could not do the same for the Republicans. Like it turned into, you know, so why do you think you want to cut the government? Well, it's because I'm evil. You know, it's because I hate people and I want to see them suffer or something like that, which I always thought was kind of interesting. This study, a little bit more depressing because it indicates that we're all kind of walking around with this not so accurate stereotype of what the other side is. And my suspicion is that really impedes, never mind compromise, just even, you know, clear communication. Uh, one of the, you know, laments I think that really has changed in our politics over the last five, 10, you know, maybe 15 years is not just do we, do we see things differently we seem to interpret reality differently. And, you know, there, there are some Democrats who would, how we see illegal immigrants, how we see government spending, how seriously we take the threat of Islamism and what, how representative we think that is of uh, a Muslim community. Uh, you can go down the list. Almost every debate that comes down the pike is not just, eh, you know, tax rates should be this much, tax rates should be that much. It very much is, a, a, you know, the sky is blue versus the sky is green. And it's kind of frustrating when you, when you you can't even find any common grounds of what we're uh, of the topic at hand, it's very tough to find a policy solution in in you know an environment like that. 
It is. And I also wonder how much of it is not just, and, and perhaps the stereotypes are fed by this, is how much oxygen the political parties and the media spend on these various issues and then uh, also paint the other side on these issues. So I think it's a little bit of a combination of factors, but some of these disparities are, are way, way off. So interesting to learn. Jim? I'm sure it'll be a quiet the rest of the week here politically. I'm, ah. I'm sure no other controversies will arise. But until then, have a great day. See you tomorrow. Actually, you know what I was going to say? One last point. I suddenly realized this, Greg, as we were contemplated the next coming Supreme Court fight and, and the recognition that Democrats really didn't have any good way of blocking it, that I realized that they wouldn't have the filibuster. They didn't have the filibuster because the Republicans nuked it earlier this year with the, when there was an attempt to filibuster Neil Gorsuch and Republicans felt justified to, to do this. Because in 2013, Harry <laughs> Reid had nuked the filibuster for all non-Supreme Court judicial nominees, Greg. So you know what we can say today in with, light of how Harry Reid's decision helped uh, free the hand for Republicans several years later? And with no irony at all. Go ahead. Yeah, an authentic way to go, Nevada. Way to go. <laughs> Thank you, Harry Reid. You don't get to say that without irony very often. Jim, have a great day. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. And if you need help getting control of your finances, LendingClub.com slash martini. Tune in again on Friday for the next Three Martini Lunch.